Hi, everybody. This is Ronel Delmont again. I'm glad to be back. I really miss doing these videos. I love hearing from people and all the comments are worthwhile reading, even the negative ones. I don't care. It's just nice to hear from people in the comments section. And if you think because I don't answer you directly that I don't know you there, I do. And thank you very much for watching all these crazy videos about a crazy crime that we're still trying to solve. It's almost a hundred years. Uh, well, not quite, but I have Nancy Atardo with me from sunny Rochester, New York. Yes. <laughs> That's such a wonderful city that I've never been to, but I know so much about. Uh, anyway, Nancy, how are you today? It's Friday. I'm great, again. Ronnell. Good. Thanks for inviting me. It's good to see you again. Yeah, I love doing these videos with you. And you're going to do something special today. You're actually reading, I don't know, is it a thousand pages? 900 page book by Scott Berg, A. Scott Berg. Yeah. Uh, called, what, what is it called anyway? Lindbergh. Simply, simply Lindbergh, right. It doesn't have a subtitle, right? No. Hmm. I forgot the time. How could I forget this? <laughs> anyway, I read it so long ago that Nancy's going to remind me and everybody else about inconsistencies that she has found galore, evidently. She's told me that there are numerous errors, and uh, I'm anxious to hear what they are. And if you want a copy of Berg's book, it might be on archive.org for free, parts of it, perhaps. But I'm sure it's in paperback and on audio. And uh, he claimed to spend 10 years researching uh, Lindbergh's life. He also lied. Uh, maybe Nancy doesn't know about this, or maybe she you heard about it, Nancy. But when when Scott Berg uh, published this book, it was 1998 when yes. I started my website at that time. And I got caught up in all of the controversy surrounding his book by people who know about Lindbergh and who know about the crime, the kidnapping crime, uh, regardless of whether they think Lindbergh did it or, or uh, the man in the moon did it. Everybody had something to say about this book that you're gonna talk about now. And one of the things I happened to find out at that time and that began my friendship with a person who just passed away a few months ago. His name was Colonel Raymond Fredette. Colonel Raymond Fredette was actually the only chosen Lindbergh researcher that ever existed in Lindbergh's lifetime. So Scott Berg claimed at the time the publication of his biography of Lindbergh uh, that he was the only biographer who was ever given access to Yale to like something like 900 boxes of mem memorabilia that the Lindbergh stashed away there. Only with the consent of the family could anybody go and look. Scott Berg uh, bragged and bragged in every column and every review. It was, oh, this is the only Lindbergh researcher given access to the Yale boxes. Well, he lied. this was the biggest lie. And how do I know such a thing? Because who, who am I, you know? But I was in touch with this colonel in Virginia who just passed away, Ray Fredette. We became close friends by phone and visits uh, for 20 years. And he, Fredette, who never wrote a book about Lindbergh, never got to publish his manuscript, um, was in touch with Lindbergh for three years before Lindbergh died, and and Anne and everybody else in Lindbergh's life. And it was Fredette who was actually the chosen biographer, chosen by, by Lindbergh himself, and then later by Anne Morrow after her husband died. So Berg comes along in 98, but 10 years earlier, he was hired by the family to, to write an authorized book. So what you're gonna talk about, Nancy, uh, I don't know if you knew any of this, so I'm explaining it, that before Berg's book was published, 
this is hearsay, but it, I heard this from people who did know, like Noel Bain, who wrote a book about Lindbergh, and from Fredette. Both of these authors told me that Berg brought the manuscript to Reeve Lindbergh up in Vermont, and she edited it. This is what they both told me, how they knew it. I don't know, but that's what I heard. So it was a, it, what you're going to talk about now is a family authorized biography of one of their relative of the family's relative who had a reputation completely ruined, almost completely, not not actually completely, because there were still people who loved Lindbergh in spite of a lot of the problems with his reputation, but the family was certainly anxious to revitalize Lindbergh, yes. who was being forgotten, right, Nancy? You and yes. I are about the same age, and we, I'm sure you have the same experience I do. When you meet people and say the name Lindbergh, does everybody know who that is? Have you had that experience? Actually, the fascinating thing was Sam met a man a few that he knew knows oh last year he mentioned about me in my Lindbergh collection and he is a man in his late 60s oh, don't tell he me. actually <laughs> said to Sam who is Lindbergh no in his late 60s maybe he had dementia does Sam's friend no he was at his job working he is a sane, capable man. Sam and I just joke about it now. It is so funny. But then I have to tell you, okay, then then this is my latest uh, Lindbergh experience. I was in Flemington, New Jersey, just this past weekend. Oh, again? Yeah. And I was going to go, be going to see where little Charlie's body was found. It's hard to find. Did you yes. find it? Yes. Well, not exactly, but I was there on the Mount Rose Road where William Allen went in. So it was late when we got to Flemington. The floor shops weren't open, so I had to go to a stop and shop for some flowers. Oh. Yes. You were yes. planning to put flowers? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Please. So I was at the checkout. I was at the checkout, and I said... Oh, I said to the young fellow, um, oh, I'm so glad you had just the right flowers for me. These are for the Lindbergh baby. He said, what? <laughs> but then, <laughs> and then another woman who was a cashier from a couple of cashier registers over, ran over and she said, oh, they're for the Lindbergh baby. Oh, I know all about the case. So it's it's fun to drop the name and see what kind of response you get. Yeah. And then the young fellow said, well, I'm very sorry that I don't know anything about Lindbergh, but I'm just 31 years old. <laughs> it's no excuse. I mean, I wasn't well, born when Washington was president, but I know he was the president. Yeah, I was born was just a couple of years after he was president. <laughs> and, but I do. And so I do know a little bit about him. Yeah. I almost. Yes. Yes. It's so funny. Yes. Yeah. I so. meet them all the time in Florida. Nobody knows who Lindbergh is. And I'm surprised about people from the global south, you know, because uh, I live in an area where everyone is from Latin America, Central America. Oh. And Lindbergh was a very big name there. Pan sure, Am. He was, yeah, you know, he was. I worked for Pan Am. Everybody knew what. Oh, speaking of that, I, I don't want to keep you because you got to get into this book. But Oh my God, I just came back from New York City, my granddaughter's yeah. birthday uh, last week. And I had to get my seat changed at uh, LaGuardia. And I and I chit chat with all the people because I worked for Pan Am for yes. several, four years. I worked big deal, but I, and I love flying. And I, I struck up a conversation with the ticket lady whatever the reservation the the lady at the counter who changed sure. my ticket she was beautiful um i don't know what country from latin america she was from but she spoke perfect english i'm sure she was an american uh you know uh, whatever she but she was latina and yet 
I don't know how old she might have been, 30. Here she is working for JetBlue, right? And I mentioned that I worked for Pan Am Airlines. And she yeah. said, what's that? <gasps> yeah. And when I got on the plane, I was so stunned. I walked onto the plane, get my seat. And I said to the the stu the, uh, the flight lady, attendant, the flight attendant, I said, the lady who changed my seat never heard of Pan Am. And the woman went running to the back to tell all the other flight attendants. She couldn't believe it either. Good. I don't know what's happening. We're getting old. That's what's happening. Apparently. Now she, Apparently. Yeah. yeah. So the people who were watching us, who will be watching this, uh, you know, I hope they're learning about the old timers. And yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 So what about Scott Berg's book that you want us to know? Well, what first, juicy first, thing? first run out, I'll show you. I have a whole room de devoted to Charles Lindbergh, The Kidnapping. It's a whole collection that I've been collecting now. July will make it 30 years that I bought the Algren Manier book. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm approaching my 30 year anniversary anniversary with Charles Lindbergh. How about that? So I will show you a couple of my fine pieces from my collection. Okay. Now, we won't go into the room because I don't think I get good reception there. But the first piece is to show our viewers who are kidnapped buffs and to show you that we are not particularly crazy. There might be someone a little crazier than us, even the whole group of us. I'll show you of a photo you tell me if you can see it well there's a lot of glare because it's in this i'll South get it Street. out of the glare this sorry it doesn't look like a familiar person no it's not a familiar person it must be a relative of Lindbergh. no is it no he's person? not he's just a normal person sam and i met him my husband and i met him years ago at rhinecliff at an air show uh -huh. okay we started up a conversation and then he took off his shirt and this is his back. <laughs> Get out of here. No. Yeah, are you kidding me? That's a tattoo no. of Charles Lindbergh's face on his back? Yes. Oh, who would do with that? How did they manage? How did they do a thing like this? Months like and months, he said this took. Months and months. Oh my God. So he definitely doesn't want to know Lindbergh killed his child. Because no, we better he, not tell him. No, he'll have to erase all of that. And yes, you know how yes, painful yes. that is. Oh, my goodness. Now, he has one child. The child is a girl. Obviously, he said if the child was a boy, the child would be named Charles. But the girl's name is indeed Amelia. <laughs> all right. Well, yeah. She okay. Now, the wonder. second thing I have, the second, this is a big thing in my collection. This is... Um, Lindbergh's book, Boyhood on the Upper Mississippi. I think it's only come out in paperback. Yeah. On page seven, Lindbergh talks about, um, in the usual good weather of a Minnesota summer, I spent most of my time outdoors. At first nearby the house, and in later years all over our farm and in the wild Williams Woods, northwest of our fence lines. I then often walked to neighbors' houses to play with their children, mostly to the Thompsons and the Johnsons, where there were boys about my age, Bill Thompson and Alex Johnson. Right. Okay. Yeah, there's something about those two people I did recent. What did you find? About you I found something? on eBay. Nancy's good looking on eBay. This is a postcard. Huh? It's embossed. It's got someone we know and love, George Washington. Right. Okay, on the front. It was sent from Washington, D.C. on February 19th, 1915. He was 13 years old. 13 years old. Here's the correspondence side of the postcard. That's his handwriting, right? Yes. To Alex Johnson. Had all uh, 
write again, write soon? What? Something will write soon? It's it's to Alex Johnson, care of Mr. Nelson Johnson, RFD3, Little Falls, Minnesota. Will write soon. Will write soon. It's to Alex Johnson. So he asks about Bill, whom he apparently hasn't heard from lately. And he says, is Bill dead? Meaning... I haven't heard from Bill. What is he, dead or what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. My postcard. How did you get, wow, that was on eBay. That oh. was on eBay. It was a bid item, Ronnell. I was the only bidder. Get out of here. I was the I, only bidder. When you say this is an advantage, nobody knows who Lindbergh is, so you oh, get it. That's right. What well, are the they bargains? Know? Who who ever heard of Limburg anymore? What do they know? They don't know to bid on something like that. <laughs> they don't. This is something else I got. Let me show it to you. I'll take it out of its little cardboard here. It's a little birthday card. Oh, cute. And look who it's written to. Yeah, Lynn. Yeah, this is Anne's handwriting. I recognize it. Yes, yeah. signed mother. And, you know, in Berg's book, Berg writes about the fact that Charles C. A. Lindbergh did not send Charles birthday cards. No, okay. He didn't. And here again, Charles didn't sign the birthday card to land when he uh, was 10 years old. He wasn't sentimental. He would, have, he would have thought that would be silly. I imagine that Lindbergh's personality didn't go along but with sentimentality of any kind. In, he was in in Berg's book. He did get very sentimental about Thor dying, the dog. You mean Lind? He did. Yes, he wrote about it in his journal, and um, well, Berg says this is his most beautiful writing that Lindbergh has ever done. It was about Thor dying. What else does Berg say? Because, you know, there's a question about Lindbergh's ability to write anything that he got. First of all, he got a Pulitzer for, what's that? The Spirit of St. Louis memoir, which I don't think he ever wrote. Fredette never thought Lindbergh wrote it either. Uh, Fredette didn't think Lindbergh wrote anything but had Anne write it for him and then, yeah. yeah. The way Lindbergh would express himself, I mean, he wasn't dumb. It's not because he was dumb that he didn't, didn't write uh, beautiful sentences, but his wife, look who he married. He married- Exactly. You know. An English major, a writer. And not only that, but she was the daughter of a millionaire, a banking millionaire, and she was schlepping all the the equipment on the the planes for him and being his his uh, not co-pilot. She was his radio operator. I mean, he he married. Uh, okay, well that's another time. What does Berg say about all of this? I'm dying to know what errors you found. Oh, are you finished with your? Collection. Yeah, my little collection show and tell. Yeah, you only have a thousand more items that are just as only a thousand more items, Ronnell. <laughs> I don't have anything. I have not. I yeah. only have a room <laughs> full of books here. Good for you. That's the way to go. I, so here's our book. Yeah, it's a nice That's photo. It's probably one of the nicest photos of young Lindbergh. He wasn't a bad-looking older person. He was quite good-looking as he aged. Very handsome. Yes, older if, man. We, if, if we don't get too specific about his comb over. I know. Well, he, right. That was not pretty. But, no. but physically, he was an unbelievable. Oh, he was so handsome. That's how he, yeah. That's how he managed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'll tell you what. I, the, the re, I had read this book years ago, and I even heard Scott Berg at the, Morven Museum. Where is that? Uh, in in Princeton, New Jersey, they had a great they had a great Lindbergh show, like about 2012 or so, if I'm remembering halfway really? correctly. At oh, Princeton, yes. what do you mean by a show? 
they put on an exhibit of his stuff or what what was they had a collection from the west trenton police museum oh at princeton they took it out of the museum and they put it in their showcase yes. yeah yeah oh and berg appeared to talk about the book and then berg appeared in princeton to talk yes so how many questions did he take it from the audience because you know didn't... i have found it on youtube his talk is on youtube I haven't been able to listen to the whole thing. So I don't know if the Q and answer session is on the YouTube. But of course, he got called on the fact that he didn't find out to write in his book about Lindbergh's three families in Germany. You mean that program was after 2004? Because that's when yes. that happened. Really? Oh, yeah. So he got called on it. And what was his answer about that? He talked a bit about the fact that Anne had an affair. So he guess, he said, I guess what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And that was that. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so, so you, you like me, I haven't read Berg's book since the day they are born, you okay, know, yeah. when it first came out. So I decided I go to a seniors group. It's it's a nationwide group. It's called Oasis. Mm -hmm. It's for seniors to take classes. And I go there and take German classes. I It's a lot of fun. And a lot of people give lectures. So I decided I would be the person who would let everybody know about Charles Lindbergh and his flight and the kidnapping. And I decided I would use two books as my references. I would use Scott Burke's book and Lisa Perlman's book. Mm -hmm. So I started rereading Scott Burke's book. And because I was going to be the lecture, I started taking copious notes. Here's my, here's my, whoops, my file. <laughs> of notes on Berg's book solely. This is it. Oy vey. Look at we that. have addresses to where they had to live. We have uh, uh, um, competitors for the race to across the ocean. We have a whole section on John Condon. Did you give a course or one lecture? It, I think it's going to be four talks. Oh. Yes, but I'm going to have my facts at hand. So, of course, obviously, I started reading this book, rereading it very, very carefully. Let me ask you to interrupt you for a second. Did you make a PowerPoint program of your lecture? I'm going to, if I ever can okay. figure out how to do it. I want to share it here. Okay. After you do it, you know. Okay. That'll be great. Yeah, it would be so. great. We'll get right on it. And I'll let our viewers know what page we're on in the Berg book. We're going to start out because yours is a kidnapping website. Um, I'm going to go right into the chapter of Sourland. Okay. Uh, Tell people actually, what Sourland is. They don't know what Sourland oh. is. Oh. You know why they don't know? I'm going to tell you. Because every single book that's been written on this crime refers to high fields. Oh, dear, no. It's not high fields until 1934, I think, or 33. They right. They called it that. It's Sourland is the proper re reference. Yeah, go ahead. Right. And the sure. whole area, that whole area, the Sourland, the Sourland Mountains are just, since being there and driving through a whole bunch this past weekend, oh, are they gorgeous. And there are big restrictions on building in the Sourland Mountains now because, in fact, I well, I was there with um, Jim Davidson, who wrote When the Circus Came to Town, and a book with Mark Falzini with all the great photos in it. And um, that area where, where Lindbergh lived in the Sourlands, all that area, has been deforested twice now to to make it into farmland in the back since, into farmland back yeah. in the 1890s i think it was deforested right. and after that 
What do you mean by deforested? They chopped down the trees? All the trees were taken down so farmers could have farmland. Because if you look at the photographs during the kidnapping, airplanes went overhead and they took photographs. There there were no trees there. No. Notice how desolate the the house looks like it's in the middle of a desert. Right. Exactly. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. So it's interesting to see the sour lands now because of the the growth is just simply gorgeous. Even underneath the trees is lush. It was just so exciting being there. Go ahead. Tell us about Berg. I'm dying to know. (laughs) So now we're on page 234, which is actually a little bit before the sour lands chapter. But he says, um, Lindbergh insisted the baby wear specially made thumb guards. Well, Jim Fisher tells us they were baby Alice thumb guards, mm-hmm. simply commercially available. Right. So they weren't specially made. And it says they had fasteners that were pinned to the crib's bed sheets. Mm-hmm. No, no. The the blankets were pinned to the mattress with big pins. But these, can you imagine? No. The baby wouldn't have been able to move Mm -hmm. if his arms, wrists were pinned down. Right. Well, now, the first time I read Berg's book, I just read that carefully and I accepted it. But that's not the way it was. No. They were baby Alice thumb guards, not pinned to the bed sheets. Now we're into the chapter on Sourlands, and that's called Sourland, chapter ten. This whole entire chapter, thirty-nine pages, he does not mention what Anne put in the March 3, 1932 New York Times about the baby's um, food requirements and the 14 drops of viasterol. Now, he, I think Berg did not want to include that. He, on purpose, omitted that. So the, and the, it's on page, this is all, why would he why would he not yeah why would he know much about the kidnapping do you think he yeah but he's got to have read if you're writing a book on the kidnapping and you're writing a chapter on the kidnapping you probably go back you can get the 75 dollars subscription to newspapers.com it's 120 nowadays oh my see we're old ronnell what do no, we know? I, I subscribed to it for years. They it okay. used to be, <laughs> but but Berg was not focused on his book is not focused on the kidnapping. So I'm sure you're going to tell us about a million errors in those chapters. Okay. Well, um, it's on page one of the New York Times. So oh, oh well, he could have found that, but he he could have yeah. he does not he does not recognize the fact. When he, he he goes, he talks about the baby's room, tells what's in the room, mm-hmm. but he neglects to mention sun lamps. The, mm-hmm. the sun lamp. Does, but everybody does. There's no mention in any book except Bain. I, I think maybe Bain doesn't even. Algon and Monier, uh, I believe, mention it. How did I know about, I would not have known about, how did we know about the sun lamp anyway? I think you see it in the photo. You see it. Well, we see a lampshade. The stick, you know, I just realized it the other day. It looks like that's the lamp, but it's not. It's the post from the look at it. Turn it around. Look at it. The post from the crib is that dark thing. The lamp, I don't know what's holding that lamp up. It looks like it's behind the screen. I it think is. the post is, is behind the screen. Right, right. But is yeah. it standing on the floor? Whatever it is, no report. Yeah. I don't. You can see the cord for the lamp underneath. Right. It's the crib. plugged under the crib. Right, right. Yeah. How yeah. did we know about the sun lamp anyway? I'm trying to remember how we knew about it. I what think I knew about, about it in my collection of photos, seen it. But it's I, not. It's not. 
only the shade is there and nobody would know that that was a sun lamp. It could just yeah. be a so, light. You so know? maybe it's even in Fisher's book, just like the thumb guards. You know how long it's been since I read Jim Fisher's book? Uh, what, you know, that's another thing. Ronell, how can we keep up? We read a book once, but then they all need to be reread. And who has the time? I, you know, I need to reread my kidnap books. You know what um, I'm rereading not, now is Airman and the Carpenter. Well, go ahead. Okay. I don't want to interrupt. Go, go, go. Um, he did not mention the baby's rickets. He doesn't mention that. No. Well, not at all. If you only not have much. one chapter on the kidnapping, how many chapters in his book? Of 900 pages, how, mu how many pages are devoted to the kidnapping? Um, he's got two full chapters. Okay, two chapters out of 900 pages. It's not very much. Yes. Else. Now, when he's talking about um, the dogs in the house, the night of the kidnapping, he only recognizes that there's one dog in the house that the Lindberghs only owned one dog oh, oh really? that they owned Wagush uh Lindbergh on page 241 Lindbergh calmly explained to Corporal Wolf that he sp suspected nobody and could could, could recall no su su suspicious behavior the dog the dog Wad Wagush had been in the opposite wing of the house that night and as Ann later noted, he couldn't have heard through the howling wind all that distance. But strangely enough, on page 347, Berg does now recognize that they had two dogs. They arranged for two of their dogs, Thor, the German Shepherd, and Skein, the Scottish Terrier, to be shipped overseas on the Queen Mary. So he conveniently didn't talk about Skane, who Lisa Perlman talked about and said that um, Lindbergh had made him disappear for that evening. Right. Yeah. And Skane was the dog who's under the, the table on the baby's first right. birthday picture. And we know from Lisa Perlman's book that the dog slept under the baby's crib. Right. Had the dog been there that night, nobody, it wouldn't have been the same crime. I mean, no. it would have been a different scenario. I I always believe now there's something wrong with it. I've tried to check into that so many times. How the dog got left behind. For me, if it's true that Lindbergh left with that, first of all, I don't think he drove Anne that weekend to the place. Did he actually drive her from Englewood to? No. He didn't, right? No. The no. chauffeur did, I think. Yes. So who left Skane behind? How did Skane get left behind then? That's the part I don't know. Right. One of the books said he was out for a walk with one of the servants at Englewood, and he just wasn't around to go in the car with Anne. Um, Lisa Perlman, I believe, says that Lindbergh had him taken someplace so he how, wouldn't be around. How would she know that? I, I've looked into that because for me, that would indicate, wouldn't it, if Skane is the dog that was within inches of his child, wherever the child was, Skane was within inches of uh, the boy. And if Lindbergh purposely left him behind on that weekend, that indicates that he knew that weekend something was going to happen to the boy. You know what I'm saying? Like, like if he purposely, if we could show that Lindbergh interfered with Skein being with his child that weekend, three hours away on a lonely estate, then we might be able to figure that he knew he had to leave that dog behind because he couldn't have accomplished the kidnapping of his child. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. Like it was a forethought. It was a planned event. Yeah. But if it happened accidentally and due to somebody else, well, then we can't say that Lindbergh knew that was the weekend that something would happen. Go ahead. I, 
I'm just, I'm, I'm confused yeah. over that dog. That whole thing about the dog. Lindbergh was so good at playing pranks. He was a master of it. Right. Um, he, he knew all the angles of how to cover all the angles mm -hmm. by the time Tuesday came. Yeah, I'm convinced of that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is on page um, 249. Uh, Lindbergh had been involved in enough dangerous ventures to know the imperative of black backup plans. And so he elected to proceed unofficially with Rosner. Okay, Mickey Rosner. Then it says in that same paragraph, um, but Lindbergh was so powerless that he felt obliged to follow every avenue, i.e. Mickey Rosner and Bits and Spitali, even down the most criminal alleys. His instincts told him there was a basic honor among thieves. Explain so who I, these people are. There are people watching who don't know who Rosner, Bits, and Spitali are. Well, they were they were small time thugs during the days of prohibition, who were generally outside the law. Right. And gang, gang -led. Dan Lindbergh yeah. hired Mickey Rosner and Salvi Spitali and Irving Bits um, to look into criminal circles, you know, and see if they could decide figure out who. In but other words, I, I, go between. They use the word. Yes, his, his, his go betweens, exactly. But I'd like to change Berg's sentence to, to read Lindbergh's instincts told him there was a basic honor among criminals. <laughs> What's the difference between a thief and a criminal? Now, there's not actually an honor among criminals. I, I mean, it puts it puts hiring these extra legal people as uh, it was a good idea for Lindbergh to do that. Um, his instincts, because he'd had much experience, told him there was a basic honor among thieves. You know, that's why people don't like to go to jail, because we don't actually trust these particularly <laughs> men. Um, so I don't think you can, I don't think you can sugarcoat that in any way. There's no well, honor among A things. lot of what Berg does is typical of what all biographers do, whether it's Lindbergh or the man in the moon, they, they have to fill out the biography, the book, to make it interesting. And they, um, they always, it drives me crazy. I'm sure I'm going to be doing this. I'm sure there are a million places in my own book where I'm guilty of the same thing, but I try to avoid it because I hate when I read a book that ap applies imagination to, to what others are thinking or doing from the point of view. In, I, I, there's a word for this and I don't know what it is, but uh, we attach meaning to the way people behave in order to make sense of their behavior. And I think Scott Berg does this. I have a big problem with Scott Berg and his book for many, many reasons other than the kidnapping. And he does this a lot, puts ideas in Lindbergh's head that may not have been, you know what I'm saying? Uh, like, how does he know what Lindbergh thought of criminals? How, do, how does Scott Berg know that Lindbergh thought uh, there was honor among criminals? I never heard Lindbergh say that. Well, I didn't read everything he wrote. Do you know what I mean? Like, Berg is putting, is putting ideas. His own spin on it. So his own spin, right. I, I, what's the word for that? Okay. So he's, that's what he does throughout the book. Of course, he's family authorized. He has to do. That. Yes, right. <laughs> now, now we've now we're on page two sixty six, and he's got John Condon. Go between in Saint Raymond's Cemetery. 
John Condon has the wooden box with $50,000 in it. And Berg says, page 266, down Whittemore Avenue, Condon handed the box with $50,000 over the hedge to John with his left hand and accepted a sealed envelope with a right. But that was Jeff C's description, wasn't it? I think Berg is have. just, he couldn't have. The box is too heavy, probably. I mean, how you hand that box, take a, the whole scenario makes no sense. I don't believe, okay, you don't, go ahead. I, I just, I don't see why saying something like that, that makes no sense. I don't understand it. Well, you can't it makes sense over. if the box is two inches by five inches, you know, but it's- Sure, you can do that. Yeah. One of the old wooden cheese boxes. It didn't have 50,000 bucks packed into it. And I don't know what that weighs. Do you know, Ronnell, I always thought, and I haven't found it, but I thought actually Cemetery John, after he got the box of cash, went someplace and right. got the note. He came he, back 10 they, minutes later, I think, five or 10 Right, minutes. they weren't handed in exact exchange. Right. Okay. So Berg didn't get his facts, <laughs> but I don't think Jeffsy told the truth anyway. So what's the difference? Okay. One lie. I think is... Jeffsy was. Yes, I think he was a loose cannon. Yeah. Yeah, we might say he that. Made yeah. Up a lot of nice stories. Um, now we've gotten to page two seventy one in the chapter. He's talking about the burlap sack that was by by the side of the road. The burlap sack, worn and blood-stained. There was no blood. Not a no. drop. No. No. Now, in contrast to what Lisa Perlman said, he says, not only had the figure black, talking about the baby's body, not only had the figure blackened severely, but that was part of Lisa's book, that was Lisa Perlman's book that was fascinating. That baby's face had been somehow preserved because it did not, it turned black when they turned it over. The air yes. made it, yeah. Now, Ronnell, I hate to say this, but I have a real hard time with misspellings, especially when it's a Pulitzer Prize winning book. What did they know? You think the people who gave him that award knew anything about Lindbergh or they probably never heard of <laughs> Doris Kearns Goodwin was on the, I forgot the, uh, uh, the other author who's very famous. What is it? Look, the, the Pulitzer, I, okay, I'm going to keep my mouth okay. shut. Okay. Well, I do think that Violet Sharp I happen to like Violet a lot. Mm -hmm. I do like Violet. I do I do think he could have written Violet Sharp's name correctly. I get confused myself whether there's an E at the end or not. I honestly, I don't, half the time I have to look it up because I never remember. Is it with the E or without the E? It's without <laughs> the E. Here's her immigration certificate. Well, let's see. Oh, I swear, Nancy. You know, I can had an answer. Really what? Can you really see? There's there's where her name is spelled yeah, no e. by Violet without the E. Right. Is that from the uh, archive? The Trenton? No, I got this online. I, I, bought a, I bought a photo of Oh, really? Of that. Yeah, yeah. So this is the absolutely correct name, mm -hmm. correct way Violet spelled her name. This is something I just got recently from eBay. This is Violet's coffin coming out of the funeral home. Right, she's buried there in Englewood. Yes, she is. I've, I've been there to the 
to there's the cemetery. No, there's no stone, I was told. There's no stone. Oh, oh, you know why she doesn't have a stone? Oh, the Moros didn't have enough money, Ronell. How could they, or, or, or uh, how could they afford to send her body back to her mother in England? That's, was her mother alive? Why didn't yes. they send her back then? I don't understand why she was never. That was cruel. No, no, but, but does anybody know any background for this? Because I, I have suspicions about Violet Sharp that are different from other people. Well, we um, see her in that photo against a motorcycle. She doesn't look. I'll say terribly feminine. Well, I the minute I saw her 20 years ago, the, any photograph of her, she looks like a transvestite. Yeah. And like I explained to you when I've said this on my forum long ago, I had an antique shop in Greenwich Village and many yeah. of my customers look just like her. You know, the, it's yeah. the capital of, of, um, of the gay world back in the 60s and 70s. And she yeah. doesn't look like a woman to me she looks like a man in drag yeah. so i i've always, if anybody knows the answer to the question uh, why she was not shipped back to her sister and her family you her parents were alive i didn't know that her mother was alive so the the family could have easily sent her body back and but why let us say she was a man instead of a, a violet she was hiding herself as a maid uh, what would wouldn't somebody have known after she killed herself her body would have had to be investigated maybe an autopsy somebody would have known what if okay I yeah. put it out there. If anybody knows the answer yeah. to why violence, yes. please let us know. It's a question to ponder. Yeah. There's exactly. so many things you could. Wouldn't it be great to know who the pallbearers were in this picture? All these good, like, do you think Ernie Brinkert was there? You know? I think that's why she committed suicide, so as not to be revealed as. Uh, that oh. her secret must have been quite, if, if I'm right, and I'm probably not right, what do I know? There are plenty of women who look like men. But yeah. I lived among trans, I, yeah, you, you, you know, were there I, I was always with those people. They came in my store. I had a belly dance class at the new school. One of my students was a man dressed as a woman. We called them queens. I don't know what the, all this LBGT whatever it is, I don't pay attention. Uh, you know, back then you were a transvestite, you were a queen, you were a drag. There, there was certain terminology. And that's what Violet looks like to me. Not one photo of her looks, looks like a natural woman. Okay. Yeah. Do um, you agree with that? You. Oh yeah, I she's. I don't think I talked about this with you before. Yeah, do you know? Um, on my very first visit to the archives at the West Trenton um, Museum, Violet Sharp's suitcase is there. Why? 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 You mean the suitcase? She came. She had one suitcase to her name. She had a suitcase, and there's a suitcase of her of her stuff there. And what was in her stuff? What, what, Just what not very stuff? much stuff. It wasn't really of interest, but it, and I probably have in in my room tucked away, I have photos of what I saw in her suitcase. Wow. Oh, fine. But I, I, I definitely need to revisit her suitcase again. Yeah. 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 And maybe you'll find a bottle of cyanide, uh, silver polish that she supposedly yeah. drank. Yeah. yeah, maybe she was holding it in her hand as she went downstairs. Yeah. No. Um, oh. On page 279, where, where Berg spells her name incorrectly, he says, before the officers could take her to the Hopewell police station, 
Well, by the time June came, the Hopewell police were long gone out of the case. Oh, were they? It was the New Jersey State Police, and they were taking her to Alpine. Uh -huh. Whatever it was, whatever she was afraid of, it had to be something, unless she was mentally unhinged, but there was no sign of that. Was there? I don't know much about her. No. But he needed to say Alpine instead of Hopewell. He needed to have the right place. My oh, now, now we're on to the investigation in the trial. This was interesting on page 297. There were dozens, there were there were talk, there were dozens of other clues that kept Kohler on the investigative trail. Dozens, he says, clues. Okay. The rungs of this homemade ladder, for example, were of soft ponderosa pine, but showed no signs of wear. Then he says, the marks on those rugs from the planer that dressed the wood revealed an unusual combination of cutter heads. So if Berg is going to tell us there were dozens of other clues, he's got to tell me more than two. Maybe he did and it got cut out. But you know what? I'm not sure there were dozens of other. Oh, listen to this. This is this is in the apprehension chapter. He says he's talking about the the ransom bills, the money that had been passed over that were all known. The numbers were known. Un Berg made a huge attempt to make sure that we know that Hauptman was guilty. Right. Okay. So this is his attempt. This is on page 297. Another 10 bills turned up during the year, most of them in Manhattan, okay? But then on the following page, he says, the very next page, the police staked out his house, Hauptman's house, which was with, within minutes of Woodlawn Cemetery, St. Raymond's, Dr. Condon's house, the National Lumber and Millwork Company, and the area in which most of the ransom money had been passed. Well, that's the Bronx, so he's got two- That's operations. the Bronx, not Manhattan. But now he wants to skewer I'm um, not sure that he's intentionally, uh, what he's, I got the impression he's intentionally misleading everyone. I, although he probably believed it himself. What do I know? He may believe Hauptman was entirely guilty and this is his way of of showing it. Of, of showing it. I, I, yes, yes, he wants to do that. Now, on page 299, um, um, Sisk of the FBI walked to the window. This is when Hutman was sitting in the bedroom on the bed and looking out the window for some reason. That's not true, by the way. I, uh, somewhere, uh, somebody explained, was it Michael Melsky? That scenario, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Tell, tell us what Berg is describing. Go ahead. So, Sisk walked to the window. There was nothing of interest outside, just a small, crude garage 50 feet away. Well, now, this is a photo. Thank you very garage. much. I love you. <laughs> it is, I it's small because. There was only people only had one car families in the 1930s, so it it holds one car. Yeah. So why are we? And then he says it's crude. Now, except for the roof that these men are taking off, right? It's not a crude garage. Not the guy, all. 
was he was a carpenter. Exactly. What well, he's calling he's I, I I just don't understand why he had to call it a crude garage. I thought that was unfair. Oh, then. I, I, what I was alluding to a minute ago was the fact that supposedly Hoffman was looking out the window and at the garage while they were interrogating him, and that's how they knew to go look in the garage. That he kept looking out the, but that story's not true. That Did you read that? Maybe in Melsky's book. I forgot where or, I read it. Oops. Okay, yeah, yeah. We should warn everybody that when you read more than one book on this case, you lose your mind. You don't remember where you found anything. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> this I thought was a little bit funny. He's talking on page 304 about Edward J. Riley, um, Hauptman's main defense attorney. Excuse yeah. me, his syphilitic alcoholic defense attorney okay good choice for an attorney okay was now referred to as death house riley for defending so many murder suspects no he was death house riley because so many of the murder sus suspects he was defending got sent to the death house right it's a whole different thing somebody can defend a lot of murder suspects but if they get them all off they won't be called death house riley right it's an epithet in other words yeah the nickname is an epithet it's not meant to be uh kind or no no it, it, he sent just... them to the death house right now, now we're on page 321 and 322, where we're discussing Cecile Barr at the movie theater. A theater cashier. He didn't tell us the, um, Cecile Barr's name. Berg didn't. No? He has, no. He hasn't included okay. her. Okay. But we know her. We know who she is. I didn't yes. know he left her name out, but he spoke yeah. about the theater. You know how many times I went to that theater? I lived a block or two away from there in Greenwich Village. It's such a dumpy old, even in the 60s when I lived there, it was a dumpy old, there was something old, shabby about it. I said, okay, what's the difference? Do you know if it still exists? You know, I was wondering, I haven't been over in that part of Greenwich Village for a couple of years. It might still be there, but I went so often, everybody, did, it's whatever. There was, all I remember is that there was one ticket booth in the front. Uh -huh. the last thing. There was only sure. one person in there. And how she could say, oh, go, go ahead. Does he say it was his birthday? Does he even tell the reader that November 26, when she claimed uh, that he gave her the, the, the $5 bill, that does Berg reveal that that was Hauptmann's birthday? Does he? Yeah. No. He does. He, he does tell us it was November 26. A theater cashier identified Hauptmann is the man who gave her a strangely folded $5 bill on November 26, 1933. Okay? Yeah. But he doesn't mention this is the day of his, uh, no. what birthday? No. He must have no. been in his Because family. he wants, he doesn't want to exonerate Hauptmann. That's not his intent. He wants to right. elevate Lindbergh. So now we're on page 323, just two pages later, and you know, no, we both made a note that that was November 26, 1933. Uh, Hauptman gave, um, well, he did. He did. On three, um, Fisher promised the capacity crowd, Fisher, one of the defense attorney, attorneys, promised the capacity crowd at the courthouse that the de defense would provide alibis for Richard Hauptman on three significant nights of the case. March 1st, obviously the night of the kidnapping. April 2nd, I think that's at the Majestic Hotel. 
No. Worth that, oh. What is it? April 2nd is the payoff, supposedly. In payoff, right. The payoff, excuse me. Yes. And then he says, April 26, 1932. Is what? Does, she doesn't say November 26. Oh, the date for the movie? The, the, yeah. The yeah. He got the date from? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> he doesn't know what he's doing. He, he's not interested in the kidnapping because um, it's not something that anybody in the family would want to be written about. It's too controversial. Right, right. There are too many holes. And you know, uh, somewhere I read, and you are the one who, who reads all of Anne Morrow's. Uh, yes. And somewhere in whether it's Reeves republishing of her mother's letters or Anne in her diary, somewhere along the line, someone asked her what she thought and she can't remember where I know this from. They thought that Hauptmann was guilty, but he had accomplices that uh, they, they believed there were other people involved. Well, the police certainly did at the beginning. Of course, they, they were looking for gangs and groups. Yeah. Yeah. But how could I, one I person who could have done? How could one person have done that? No. No. Um. <laughs> It's only because I'm a stickler for let's tell the facts correctly and let's spell things correctly. He's talking on, on page 322, Sheriff Curtis at the courthouse, the jail in Flemington. Unfortunately, he has Curtis spelled with one, one S. S. Yeah, it gets confusing, doesn't it? Because there's that other Curtis, yeah. There's John Hughes Curtis. Right. Known as a hoaxer. But there is the trial pass. It, this is in glass, so the best I can show it right. with Curtis with two S's. My lamp right. is getting in the Pierre way. Pierre Almadar is making a killing on you. He's the owner of eBay. Yes. Oh, Ronell. Ronell. Um, mm. Oh, um, <laughs> Kinberg's book. <laughs> Um, let me, I can find this. I'll, I'll look in the back if we don't get cut off. Page 170. I'll tell you about spending money. Page 170, Berg writes, um, I got 176. No wonder I can't find it. Um, he's talking about Lindbergh's fame after the big flight and decades later in 1990 a man in Maine paid $3,000 for the crate in which the spirit of St. Louis had been shipped home mm -hmm. so that it could be enshrined Right. well it's in Canaan, Maine and I've been there. Larry Ross is the right. owner. Right. But I think he sold it. I think it's in New Hampshire now. There's an update on that story. Because I, you know why I looked into it? Because Lisa Perlman uh, discusses the wood for the ladder, mentioning that the size of the rails looked like it was European and that it was of a European size. I've, I'm not exactly describing it the way she says it in the book, but she indicates, she she raises the question about where the wood actually came from and that the size was of European measurements. I, I forgot why she says that, but that made me think because I know about the crating of his plane, the British put his plane, he hated, I heard these stories from Fredette for 20 years. Fredette kept telling me Lindbergh hated the British because they took his plane apart and they put it in crates. And when they got, and uh, the captain of that ship, the Memphis, uh, the one- Burridge, who, Admiral Burridge. Who shows up with Curtis later on during the- Right, Burridge, in Norfolk. Well, that uh, Admiral Burridge asked Lindbergh if he could have the crate. 
and there were two crates, one for the wings and one for who knows how they packaged it, but you know how touchy Linda was. What? And yes, and one, then one for the fuselage. The fuselage and the whatever. I, I yeah. you know, but Fredette kept telling me they crated it. And I said, well, did they damage his plane? What was he so upset about? Well, you know, Lindbergh wrote that book called We. He and his plane were two living. <laughs> um, nobody could touch that plane without making him nervous. But anyway, getting back to the crates, as you're trying to tell us, uh, Larry oh. Ross had the crate, but he got it from Burridge, who owned it as a summer home in, I guess it was Maine, I don't know. And then Larry Ross, are you sure that Larry Ross still has it? Because I know it's in New Hampshire now. It's not in Maine anymore. It's not there anymore. And he must not have it. But I was saying about Larry Ross, as opposed to me, yeah. And all my friends on eBay, where all my dollars go flying, <laughs> Larry Ross has not purchased with his money anything to go into the Crate Museum. He only accepts donations. Really? Yeah. That well, I know from you... Larry Ross. You know Larry Ross? I, yeah, I went to the Crate. I visited there. What what year was that? Um, that was probably the early two thousands, oh. late nineteen hundreds, probably maybe late nineteen hundreds. So, yeah. Wow. So you were in the crate that Lindbergh's plane was. Uh, so what did it feel? Like? What kind? Of, he didn't decorate it. He didn't put plaques up and pictures inside on the walls. No, he's got he's got Lindbergh artifacts inside. Oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. he made a little museum. He made a little museum out of it. But, and then outside, this was really fun. He constructed a miniature Spirit of St. Louis that he had hung between two trees and a small child which at that point was Sam's daughter, could get in the plane and fly his wow. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. It was a tourist yeah, yeah. attraction. It was, a, it was a true tourist attraction. Wow. Now here's another tourist attraction that people might not know about. But I read somewhere, you know, at this point, that's the best we can say is somewhere we read this. And it would take us years to find out which of our 200 books it's in, but that Charles Lindbergh is in fact in a stained glass window in a church in Springfield, Massachusetts. Oh my God, in a church, the last place he'd want to be. Among, <laughs> among, well, he might be the, one of the last persons we want, we want there as Lindbergh, a, a Lindbergh among the saints of the stained glass windows. So Sam and I indeed did go to Springfield, Massachusetts to church there. Are pictures of this? Yes. Like photos? Yes. Oh, I'd love I, to see a stained glass Lindbergh in a church window. That's something else. He was, I believe he was an atheist. The, oh, then I copied a picture, a paper for you just today. Yeah. From from um, Joyce Milton, Loss of Eden, where after the war, he began carrying Bible. the New Testament with him. Yeah. I knew you were interested in that, and I found the reference for that for you. Uh-huh. In Joyce Milton's book? Yes. He carried a Bible? No, he carried the New Testament. Oh, well, much smaller. It is. The New yeah. Testament smaller than yeah, smaller than the Old Testament. Would be both, yeah. And it says he carried it in his suitcase. It doesn't. Um, it specifically doesn't say he read it, Ronell. It right. says he yeah. carried it in his suitcase. Right. Who yes. But knows? next time we chat, I will show you Lindbergh in the stained glass window. Oh please! I have. To he was that. he was being honored in the window 
for connecting two continents. Uh-huh. Which and was you, let's yeah, pardon. Which was what? Go the, ahead. the America and Europe. Yeah. And he was he was honored for bringing making I guess the world smaller and helping bringing the the world closer. That's what he was being honored for in the window. What denomination? What sect? Uh, of Methodist. Methodist. Really? A beautiful stone church. A beautiful stone church in Springfield, Massachusetts. Wow. That's something I I knew he was a hero, but I didn't think. Whatever. Interesting. What else is in Berg's book? I don't like Berg's book because of the way he omits things that I know that we all know about. Uh, he goes from one paragraph to the next, avoiding the issue of why they fled the country. Uh, if he had done his job and done the research, he would have known that they fled when Governor Hoffman uh, announces, uh, when it, uh, Hoffman did not announce it, the press found out that Hoffman, the governor of New Jersey, was secretly investigating the case after Hauptman was uh, set to be executed. He was trying to save the life of Hauptman, and it was a secret. The governor wasn't, it wasn't appropriate, maybe political, well, certainly politically, it wasn't a good idea, but people found out suddenly in the headlines that he was doing this. And that very day, Anne wrote in her diary that C, meaning her husband, Charles, ordered her to pack up. They were going to leave in 24 hours notice for Europe, and they don't know when they're coming back. That was the day the headlines hit about Hoffman, Governor Hoffman's investigation. So Berg, if you go through that part, that December of 1935, he juxtaposes the paragraphs in a way that makes it's very tricky. He's tricky, very tricky. The whole book it's is very full, tricky. Full That's a good tricks. way to put it. Yeah, it's a tricky book to read, full of misguided, mis full of, but, but then again, you know, it's his book. I have to tell you, when he came to Miami, for the book show, the book fair. We have the biggest book fair in the whole country here in Miami. I don't go for many years, but at that time I went every November. He appeared and I sat by the microphone waiting for the chance to ask him a question when he got finished because he had been all over the country with this book and I knew that he only took two questions. It seemed like he only took one or two questions from the audience, and then he skedaddled himself out of there, didn't want to answer too many questions, it seemed. So I was afraid that I'd get left behind. I sat by the mic, and I was the first one up, and I confronted him. C-SPAN filmed the whole thing, and I confronted him with, the, with many questions, one of which was, didn't you read all Ammonia and didn't you, why didn't you include in your big biography that there is a theory now that Lindbergh killed his own child? Well, the audience of 500 people gasped when I said that. Uh, Did you have the audacity to ask, right? audacity i felt it was my duty i mean well I it was but that's <laughs> but that but that was their thinking right how can she be so bold oh that's well, why they gasped well I, I was too passionate in the beginning i mean i've calmed down a lot i've mellowed <laughs> but in those days i was extraordinarily confrontational and i sh maybe i shouldn't have been because yeah, but, to be but you lived in new york city <laughs> yeah, I'm a New, New Yorker. York yeah, I got hooked. How, how can you take the New York City out of Ronell? Yeah, yeah, that's true. But I, I was, it was rude of me to present it that way. I wasn't, I was accusatory and it was obvious, but I was really angry. I'll tell you why. In every interview that he did over that book, there were pictures of him in his private library or his office. And behind him were all his books. 
on the shelves. And I thought, I, if I could find the photographs again, I scrutinized every photograph of Berg in his office. And behind him was Algren and Monia's book on his shelf. Because I have every book and you know how you stack them up and you could see by the binders what the what the titles are. Absolutely. And I'm looking at Algren and Monia's book right now on the shelf and it was behind him. He had the book. I believe he had the book because it's in the photographs of him in his office. So it angered me even more that he owned the copy that I believed. I could be wrong now. I'm thinking maybe I I, I didn't see correctly, but I'm, I think I saw correct. The, the timeline was, fits. The timeline fits yeah, for now. Yeah, of course. They wrote it in 93 and his book came out five years later. He, ha he had to have known about their book. I agree with you. So why I argued with, I was very um, confrontational in my questioning. And the first thing I said to him was, why didn't you include Algren and Monier's theory that he killed his own child, that he accidentally, because at that time, I didn't formulate a theory of eugenics. I was with Algren and Monier's idea that it was an accidental killing. Right. And I and I and I confronted him with that, and I didn't let him take a breath to answer me before I I said again, my second thing was, did the family authorize you, and did they tell you what to write? In other words, that those were the two things that worried me. That Berg, his book seemed. I, I was told by Noel Bain, who died later. I never got to meet him, but I had an hour and a half conversation with him. Actually, he had an hour and a half lecture to me. He never saw. And um, he informed me that he knew that Berg's book was hired by the family to revive Lindbergh's reputation, because his name was Mud after the German medal, and that the family hired Berg this is all on my website because I wrote an editorial about all of this for the forward newspaper at the time. Uh, Noel Bain, okay, to get to the point, Noel Bain told me that Reeve had something to do with editing Berg's book, which if you're writing a biography of a famous person, this is not really a good idea to have, you know, so I, I confronted him with that and he was enraged. He, he, no, he said, no, they didn't tell me what to write. And uh, I would have said now, well, they didn't have to tell you what to write when you're authorized by your family. You know what to write. You know you shouldn't put bad stuff in there because they're not going to like it. You, you know. Exactly. And this is what Fredette kept telling me for 20 years. He found out he... He couldn't write what they wanted him to write, so he never published his book, which I never saw. Uh, so with Berg, I am there standing among about 500 people in the audience. And this is Miami, November 98, I guess it was. And I asked him if they authorized his writing, if they told him what to write. And he, that's what angered him. And he said to me, well, when you write your book, you could put whatever you want in it. Well, he's right. And it's taken me 20 years and I'm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I did confront him and, you know, it's not a bad book if you don't know. And the problem for us, anybody who reads a lot about Lindbergh can see what Berg was doing. I think it's a whitewash of Lindbergh. I don't know what you think. You, you are here to tell us what you think. You read the book recently. Tell tell us. I I think it's he's he's done mostly omissions. Well, for he, people like us, right? Because yes, there's not okay. too many details. But he wasn't studying the kidnapping. You got to give him, you know that. Yes, he, but you have to know that Breckenridge both Henry and Ada were eugenicists. 
And you have to know what the close relationship was between the Lindberghs and the Breckenridges. You have to understand that not just Carell was interested in what he calls voluntary eugenics, but he was huge and Lindbergh were both huge into building this master race of the elite of which they both thought they were elites. Mm -hmm. He doesn't go into no. Lindbergh and eugenics. He just omits it. He doesn't that talk is, about it at all. Nothing about the farm with the chickens and the cows and the, he doesn't talk no. about that in his book. No, no. How no. he chose his wife. Because Lindbergh talks about it. Yes, well, Lindbergh didn't do a very good job of choosing his wife if there were mental health issues on her side of the family. Mm -hmm. um, but he he glosses over that. He, he just doesn't want to talk about certain things. He will ignore them. He won't tell you about what would Lindbergh have done if he was, if he had an opportunity to participate in World War II, what would he have done if he had been assigned to the European theater? Would he have done the bombing and the strafing over Germany? Or was he just happy to do it over the yellow hordes, mm -hmm. the teeming yellow hordes mm -hmm. in Japan and the islands? Oh, well, he talks, he doesn't. Yeah, he talks about how Lindbergh strafed and bombed in Asia, in Japan, and right. J in Japan's islands. Right. But he he ignores the fact that he was happy going to the East. But what if he had been assigned over Germany? Then what would Lindbergh have done? But he wasn't assigned the Pacific. He just went there. I know the story because Fredette, Ray Fredette told it to me a hundred times over 20 years. Lindbergh was... Um, he wasn't assigned to anything. He was not, he was a civilian during the war. Roosevelt, right. and they wouldn't allow him to touch a gun or anything for the army or whatever. He had given up his uniform. He gave up his commission in order to make speeches on behalf of isolationism. And uh, that's a whole other story. But he, as a civilian, what Lindbergh did during the war was he would just travel around and he knew everybody in the middle, like Hap Arnold, all these people, MacArthur's wife, General MacArthur's wife was a friend of his mother's. I, I, the, the connection, Lindbergh had connections with everyone and he would just go places on his own. So he ends up in the Pacific, just he shows up. You know, all the guy had to do was show up at an airline and there was always a seat on every airplane for him. You know that, he never paid for a ticket. Uh, he traveled the world and nobody knows to this day where, where the heck he was most of the time. How many Lindbergh babies are there out there, we'll never know. But, but he just showed up in the Pacific and got himself palsy wowsy with the guys and one day i i have trouble believing this but fredette told me it was true that he did go up and shoot down some japanese planes supposedly that's true but i don't believe i don't know why i, I don't believe anything that Lindbergh said he did i it's hard for me to accept things after knowing what a prankster he was so he was just, he spent his entire life doing nothing. Uh, he didn't work. He just went around the world doing, I don't know what he was doing. Nobody does. I don't, and certainly didn't know. And um, whatever he did during the war, it was as a civilian, which by the way, was illegal. He should have been held on charges and put in jail. If it was you or me that went up in a plane as a civilian and shot down, or you were endangering others by being a civilian doing your own thing. That's how the War Department would have looked at it. But he was Lindbergh, so what were they going to do? And at the end of the war, they made him a brigadier general because his pals were Eisenhower did. Yeah. Right. 
Those, those were the women. Given, he was given carte blanche. Right. During World War II. Right, because at the end of and that, they said they would turn. He, he was they they gave him the position as an observer, which which oh. said that he was not to be in a position to shoot or drop bombs. But they said said if you do, no one in the states will know. Who said that? Where did you read that? That's in Berg's book. Oh, it is. Oh, I have to read that chapter. I'm not sure he's telling the truth about that. He's saying that who gave him uh, permission to do these things? Berg drops, and I'm exaggerating, the names of 100 high-level Army Air Force people that Lindbergh meets with, gets in touch with, during the stage of World War One or World War Two, when he went to the Pacific, he Berg drops officers' names like there are five. I'm exaggerating again, five per page. It's a mass number of. Oh yeah, it's just crazy in that chapter. Oh wow, I have yes. to look at that. Yes, and you know, of course, I know the name Hap Arnold. And I know MacArthur, but I don't know any of these other people. Yeah. So I don't know which which um, Army official or Army Air Force official told Lindbergh that he could then, when he found out that Lindbergh was actually bombing, um, when he found that out, he told him he got dressed down by one um, officer and then another officer said, I can make you an official observer. You're still not supposed to be bombing, but the United, we will turn our eyes, avert our eyes, and the United States will not find out about it. They won't know in the United States. You see, they do their own thing. They can get away. They did their own thing. Yeah. Right. But I don't think Lindbergh would have done the same thing over Germany. That's a great, I never thought about that. I, ne I never thought to ask that question. That's a great question. What would he, he have done? Lindbergh thought in terms of races. Right. And in terms of, and then he also turned, when he thought about races, he thought about there were a few good people in certain races. So he included Harry Guggenheim as a good person of what he called the Jewish race. Otherwise, as a whole, we know how he felt. Well, and you can't say that Lindbergh, oh, he was an anti Semitic. Harry Guggenheim was his friend, good friend. Yeah, well, Henry Ford had a Jewish architect building uh, River Rouge. Kahn, Great. That guy Kahn. Great. I mean, you know, there was... We know, we know Henry Ford's background as right. far as that's concerned. Right. Yeah. So even the worst anti-Semite, I mean, even Hitler's chauffeur was uh, Maurice, I forget his last name. Hitler's chauffeur was a Jew. I mean, th th when the Jew comes in handy, they're, they're okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Lindbergh, yeah. the anti-Semitism was. Oh, uh, can I tell you was, about? Can I tell you about Diane Guggenheim? Diane Guggenheim was that his first wife? I thought she was. No, that was his wife. daughter. Oh, okay. What uh, his, yes, I've read a little bit about Diane Guggenheim. She was. She's actually made a record. She's got a record out of her playing, but. Uh, Playing the harpsichord. Nice. Yes. Is that but his I, only child? His only daughter? Did he have other? His children? only child by his wife Carol. He, oh. I think he had a couple other kids, but but Harry was married a couple times, at least twice. But Diane Guggenheim didn't want people to know who she was, so she changed her name actually, but didn't do it legally. She just changed it yeah. to Diane Hamilton. Oh. And that's how you find out about Diane Hamilton. Oh. But Diane Hamilton in New York City met two of the Clancy brothers. Oh, I love these guys. Okay. Oh. 
So she heard that the Clancy brothers had a mother in Ireland who knew folk songs. And Diane Hamilton was very interested. She was a folk song collector. Mm -hmm. So she went to Ireland to collect folk songs and she appeared on the doorstep of Mrs. Clancy, um, oh. Tommy and Pat's mother, Patrick's mother. There she met Liam Clancy. Wow. Who ended up, she fell in love with Liam Clancy. Literally or just? His... No, she fell in love with him. She wanted them to be a couple. She was in her mid thirties. Liam was only in his mid twenties. Mm -hmm. He wasn't ready for a romantic relationship. But one of the things he wasn't ready for, she was already, she had been married. She was divorced and she had a child mm -hmm. in her mid thirties. I think she got married when she was 19. But one of the reasons that Liam couldn't get especially interested in Diane Hamilton was because she sucked her thumb in public. Really? Wow. This is all in Liam Clancy's book, The Women of the Mountain. Wow. The Women of the Mountain. That's how I that's how I find found out. That's where you find out the information about Henry Guggenheim, Harry Guggenheim's daughter, Diane. Well, the only, I, I've reviewed books about the Guggenheims because they're a very interesting family. But um, there's gonna be a part in my book about one of their relatives who, uh, well, it's a fascinating family. I don't yeah. know. I hear different things from different books and authors who write about the time period of, you know, when Lindbergh was, head, was making speeches for the America First Committee, they were pro-Hitler, pro-German, pro-Nazi. As far as I'm concerned, they were pro-Nazi speeches, uh, anti-British anti-intervention, whatever you want to call right. it, whatever he was doing, he was trying his best to keep America from interfering between Hitler and Stalin. Uh, the whole purpose of which, as I've said this before in other, in other videos, the, the idea from Lindbergh's point of view and his friends and people who thought like him was to allow Hitler to do away with Stalin and all of communism on the planet. Hitler was going to save the world from communism. It didn't work out that way. <laughs> but um, so what was I getting at? There was a purpose for interrupting you again. Um, so no, I forgot. Uh, yes. So the, the, it's brought up very often in other people's books. Lynn Olson brings it out. All these books about the 30s. Uh, whether or not Goog Harry Guggenheim still spoke to Lindbergh. Yeah. Though, you know, and I don't know the answer to that. I, I can't imagine that Guggenheim would still want to be seen with Lindbergh or be connected with him after everything, after he becomes Brigadier General. I forgot when Harry died. I don't, I don't know. remember how long he lived. Well, he lived into the 60s because he married Alicia Peterson Patterson, who owned Newsday out on Long Island. And Harry refused to allow her. I, this is in the book about Madeline Albright is related to those people in the news. Okay. Business. Yeah, Albright, her name, Albright. Is, she, her memoir is all about this family and... Um, the guy on PBS who I love, what's his name? He was the editor of Newsday. Anyway, yeah, so Harry Guggenheim had a Carol and then Alicia Patterson who died on an operating table and he became the owner of Newsday newspaper. Whether or not he still admired Lindbergh, I, I can't imagine that he did, but then again, who knows? People get forgave we Lindbergh. Have to, we have to wonder. I I didn't. I, I've never read this before, but in Berg's book, he talks about the estrangement between Lindbergh and Breckenridge. 
Oh, he yeah. does talk about that? Yes, but you know what he says? What? He says that it was partly due to the $20,000 loan okay. that Breckenridge had from Lindbergh that Breckenridge did not repay. That's what Anne refers to an argument over a check that Breckenridge didn't repay Lindbergh. He gave a campaign because Breckenridge was running for president against Roosevelt at some point. He, so that's why Breckenridge would have wanted that sum of money. Maybe he wanted the money. Maybe it was longer, and maybe it was just a payment for helping him with the case. And they didn't want it to be known as that, so he made it look like a campaign uh, presentation. But I don't trust the. I don't. I don't trust anything I hear because there was a connection between Lindbergh and Breckenridge that we don't know about. It's very. Don't you think it's mysterious their relationship during the trial and during the, the 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 whole. Well, the Breckenridges were at the house that weekend. Right. 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 And this. Why did Lindbergh call Breckenridge? The second phone call he made exactly. for eugenicists all together with the baby not normal. Yes. The baby looks more normal than we make it sound. There's not really, I don't, the, the only thing I see about the child that's questionable to me, okay, he has a very big head. He had rickets that we cannot see. He looks, he doesn't look his, like his bones are curving. Um, and there is something wrong with him, but we can't know exactly what it is. It's rickets, it's a big head. The fontanel didn't close at the time of his death, but he doesn't look that, does he look that sick to you? The only thing he's I adorable. see- He's adorable. I'll, he's yeah. adorable. And the only thing I see is that he never looks happy. The child it's is- but What's the last photo we've ever seen of the baby, Ronnell? The one in the swing, I think, with the short hair. Is that the last picture of him? I don't, I don't know that picture. Yeah, why, did they put, why did they put, when he was 20 months old, why did they use the birthday picture? I, I think I know why, because that is the cutest. That photograph with him holding on the bars with the curly hair on the want pick on the want ads, it's adorable. Most That's people, such a, he's he's just sitting at the table with a cake on the on the table. Oh, that wasn't on the want ad. The mm -hmm. want ad was a full face picture, lots and lots of curls. So Oh, we, looking forward. That's from probably North Haven when he was up in North yeah. Haven. And he's he's looking over the crib rail or the, the yeah that's rail. that's from yeah that's from the summertime that's, that's from the summertime adorable, it's it's the only adorable picture yeah but it's picture? not an accurate picture of a twenty of month old not. No. if you're looking for a twenty no. month old don't look for a twelve or thirteen month old baby Absolutely. you know I did ask Reeve I asked I saw Reeve one time at a book set book signing and I asked her why we don't have any recent pictures of the baby. And? and she said, well, they're all available at, at Yale. Yeah, and I said, I said, I don't think I can get into the archives without permission from the Lindbergh baby. I mean, the Lindbergh family. And she said, yes, the photos are available without the Lindbergh permission. So let me announce right now to anybody listening to us that they're all available online. I went, it took me, I think, two weeks to look at all of them. There's 65, uh, there's 65 pages and there are about 10 pictures on each page. And I went through it, it took weeks. And of all the thousands of family pictures or pictures relating to Lindbergh, uh, there are maybe 10% or 5% 5 I would say, I'm just guessing, uh, were of the baby. And he doesn't smile. He looks angry, he scowls, 
he d always looks like he's in a predicament of some kind, but that picture is cute. You have to say- Ronnell, that's fantastic for everybody to know about that we can look online yes, for these yes, photos. Yes, 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 yes. Go to Yale University, Sterling Library, and put in Lindbergh and all the pictures. Reeve was correct. It's all available. But but no, there are pictures that are not... Because hmm. somebody sent me photos that Betty Gao had taken. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure if those are on that same website. But go, and you you you'll spend weeks looking at every picture. Many of them are doubles. So, but there's 65 pages. 65. Wow. Pages. You know. That's, so I guess we'll this family here will plan on a lot of takeout dinners for the next two weeks. <laughs> That's all that's going to happen here right now. And, and I dare you to find a cuter picture than the one they that's chose for the one in. What? That's fascinating. Well, you have to, you have to wonder why, why did he give them a picture a year old? Well, it was almost a year old. The picture that he gave was the child was about a year, right? Yeah. 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 So, he's got green leaves behind his, blonde curls yeah that's not february in new jersey oh that's right i never thought of that yeah it's the summer you're right huh you know when you live in florida everything's got oh, green leaves oh yeah, yeah yeah you have to live in a northern climb to don't appreciate think like a new yorker anymore right 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 so that's my take on the photograph business why did he choose an old picture they knew he was dead, so what's the difference? They didn't, in my theory, they didn't um, plan to have anybody, I, I don't know. Sometimes I think they did, sometimes I think they didn't have somebody captured and convicted and put in the electric chair. I don't think that was the plan, but who knows what the plan is? We can all make stuff up all day long that's the whole point it's because we don't know that we keep reading mm -hmm. and reading every book we can get our hands on and you get more confused with every book <laughs> yes the answers aren't there are they no not nobody's yet not anyway there. no so but so your take on the bird book i don't want to ask you to give it a a, a you know, a rating, but I would, I enjoy reading books, even though I disagree with the author. The only book that really makes me angry is Fisher, because I know, see, I don't know whether Berg would change his ideas, or, but I know Jim Fisher would never change any, it's like everything's written in blood and stone, and Jim, he's a fundamentalist, you know, he believes, Jim, yeah, Right. Jim Fisher is so sure of himself. Right. He's, he, he will rant about revisionist history and right. all of that. I, I have a hard time going there. You know, as I've been reading Berg, I've been looking back into Joyce Milton's book, Lois, Loss of Eden, and I find her personal commentary so, so good. <laughs> and so well written in her own take at one point she talks about the Lindberghs is the la as the last great amateurs mm -hmm. in, an, in an age of amateurism and she will put her own thoughts in there and I think they're so well thought out they're so cogent that I really love reading her book yeah I told her I thought the book was great, but then in the conversation that I had with her also an hour and a half, two hours on the phone, because I called all these people to ask what they thought about Berg's book. This is oh. 98 when his book came out. Yep. And I was so hysterical over it. I, I, I calmed down since then. <laughs> but, but I was angry because he left out all pneumonia. Like who gave me the, the the right to defend Olga? You know, but I was angry that Berg had left them out of his book. It didn't even mention them, and I called Noel Bain, and he told me that Reeve had had um, 
input into what went into the book and what was taken out of the book. Uh, he claimed he knew that. And Fredette told me the same thing. So there were two, I have two advisors who told me the same thing and neither of them knew one another. Yeah. Uh, but with Joyce Milton, I have a problem with her that I never brought up. She wrote a scathing book about the Rosenbergs with a guy named uh, Ronald Radosh. And uh, I'm a defender of the Rosenbergs since a very long time. And uh, Joyce Milton was an author of a very, I think, a very bad book about them. An unfair book, right? And very unfair. But I didn't bring that up with her. I didn't want to discuss it. I only talked about Berg and what she thought of it. And, and we got onto the topic of what she thought about Hauptmann. And she told me that he built the ladder. And I said, how could he have built such a ladder? And why is it so shoddy? He was a good carpenter. And her answer was that he got the call late at night and he had to make it quickly. And he went up to the attic to get the wood because he didn't have time. I said, how did he get a call? He didn't have a telephone. Well, the, the, the other end of the phone went silent. She was stunned. I'll never forget this because she had no idea Hauptmann had no telephone. And she's telling me he got the call. I, okay, so I said he didn't have a telephone. Why? Would, how could he have known? She said, well, they got him the message some way or another, and he had to build the ladder quickly. So that was, you know, none of us really know what happens. So we have to make up things to connect the dots. And that's what everybody's been doing. But just one more thing about Joyce Milton's book, and it's a good book. I, you know, like I say, only Jim Fisher upsets me because he's okay. a fundamentalist in the sense that he refuses to budge. You know what I mean? The others, uh, I don't get that feeling about them. But she, her book has been made into an opera. Been made in, you know that, Loss of Eden is an opera. Somewhere in the Midwest, it appeared long ago. Uh, no so kidding. just, yeah, Loss of Eden is an opera. I don't know where it's performed nowadays, but it, it was made into an opera because it focuses on the tragedy of the life, the marriage, the lives of Anne and Charles. And the tragedy of the kidnapping only enhances the interest in their lives. You know, right. Uh, this is the book I'm, I'm being reacquainted with. It used to be called The Airman and the Carpenter, and now it's called Crime of the Century because they made a film, Ludovic Kennedy's book. And I, you know, it's been a long time since I've been outraged by anything because you get to accept the unfairness of Hauptmann's execution, the unfairness of the oh. world. But this book has reignited my anger to a point where I, I have to put it down because I got so angry. It all has to do with the parts I'm reading about Pesha. Uh, for people who don't know what I'm referring to, there's proof that Hauptmann worked on the night of the supposed kidnapping and they hid this from the jury and they hid this from the authorities. They put the timesheets in a safe in a guy named Breslin's office in New York City. Just, I'm uh, Nancy, you too, read the chapters. It's laid in the book somewhere in the back on the Majestic Hotel timesheets and the employment records, how they frame this is one of the most anger provoking parts of Ludovic Kennedy's book, which is great. Okay, so maybe next time. Let, let's do that. Yeah. Um, and there was another book. Oh, there's so many new books. I had an idea that I would do a book review of all the books. <laughs> too many books. Someone recently wrote, I think, an excellent book about the, I don't even remember the name of it, The Spiritualism of Charles Lindbergh. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's very, I well, love Bert reading goes it. Into that. Bert goes into that. 
Well, because oh, and even 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 um, Anne Carell was into the use of pendulums. Both of them. I, I think that might have even gotten him started because then he moved on from his time in Iliac to to move on to other yes. Yes, 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 yeah, yes. But the book is written by a minister. So he analyzes Lindbergh's attitudes about religion and spiritualism. And uh, I never finished the book. I, I wish I had time to do that because I would love, maybe next time we could talk about that. Or what what would you like to talk about next time? I, But I think it'd be fun to talk about Ludovic Kennedy's book. You want to read it? And we'll it? Yeah, yeah. yeah I amazing. haven't read it in a long time. Me neither. And I'm I'm reawakening my anger. I'm getting. I I I was so upset. I walked around all week. I'm still not over it. What they did okay. with the timesheets. Okay. Okay. Uh, it'd be good for the, me to reread that one. That'd yeah. be good. Now I can tell you a little bit about Ludovic Kennedy. Oh. What? Do you know the woman he married? I forgot who was she. She was Myra a, Shearer. Yeah, the red okay. shoes. Yes. So let's say Myra Shearer, the dancer. Yes. Okay. The red shoes. So he met, yes. Movie. Yes. So he met her in in she I read his autobiography. Okay. How and he, he asked her to dance. They were at a party. When the first time he met her. And do you know what Moira Shearer said to him? No. Oh, she said, I can't really dance. Well, that kind of dancing is different from ballet. It is. Yeah, but she could dance all right. It's just kind of so, cute. So could I. But when it comes to doing waltzes and other things, you know, it's not belly dancing anymore. It's, uh, yeah. You know, it's, it's I, you dance. can do ballet and not know how yeah. to do uh, modern, you know, uh, disco ballroom dancing or to, disco. To dance. Yeah, yeah. But uh, there was something. Oh, oh, yeah. I'd love to talk about this book with you and Ludovic Kennedy. He wrote another book called Ten Rillington Place about a case that he had revealed the killer wasn't the killer or Oh. Was, that, was that in his biography that you read? Must have been there. I, yes, I think I think it was. Yes, I have yeah. a copy but, of the film. It's it's very stark and really. It's called Ten Rillington Place. It's a very very scary, mysterious movie, British film. Yeah, that's what he was famous for, uh, exposing the uh, exposing the innocence of somebody who was found to be guilty. Fascinating. So this was right up his alley with Hauptmann. Yes, very, very much so. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I love you, Nancy. Take care. Maybe one day we can get together on an imaginary Richard Sloan bus tour again. Oh, <laughs> that's yeah. How, that's how yeah. we know each other. So be well and we'll be back. Anything you want to say about? I'm just saying thank you, Ron. Now that was just loads of fun. Yeah, loads of fun to chat time. with you and see you. Yeah, I'm afraid it's too long, but we'll be back. Yeah, that's long. great. Love you too, Ron. Now thanks a million. Great fun. Take good care of yourself. I will. And keep working care. on your book. Uh, yes, you'll be the first to know. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye.